Welcome to Serial Bookworms, where we are reading through Mother of Learning a few chapters at a time and talking about them every other week. Feel free to participate, speculate, and ask questions. I ask that you please keep the topic to the current knowledge and chapters if you have read ahead on this story. Uh, we are covering uh, chapters 16 through 18 today. We open the chapter with Zorian already applying a solution to Amaya's request of informing her when he's going out, going to be out late. It seems to have only taken a couple days for him to find a way of sending a message via a paper airplane primed to locate Amaya and able to cast it with confidence it will work. Zorian's ability to pick up new spells seems to have taken leaps and bounds as it usually took him a couple loops before we saw a spell he thought about finding to it being used, even in a crude fashion. Could be part of his experience, or could be all those shaping spells he has spent an inordinate amount of time uh, practicing on. Zorian makes his way to a tavern, as Haslush has apparently must conform with some variant of a grizzled noir detective stereotype, but he crosses the threshold where treated to an interesting series of events. Zorian first assumes that Hashlish isn't in here, then he notices his desire to leave feels a little unnatural, and resorts to a quick location spell to beeline to Hashlish. Brushing past the off-putting factory worker's uninviting response to Zorian approaching him, he dispels what turns out to be an illusion. Turns out this is a test of Zorian's ability to observe his surroundings and take in detail. Haslish put Zorian to the test, to this test, because divination's peculiarities lend them to people with an eye for detail and quick, accurate insight. You may know how to ask a question, but you still have to know if the answer you get is wrong and whether it can be trusted. Although Zorian handily beat the test due to his mental resistance training with Chiron for the past few loops, Haslish then moves forward with a second phase. He blacks out Zorian's ability to see the surroundings and questions him on specific details. The number of people, how many of an object are along the wall, etc. While the specifics are quickly glossed over, uh, it's a very good example of why eyewitness testimony is not as ironclad as movies and other media make it seem. The mind fudges a lot of our memory, and that can be even worse during a stressful or boring series of events. Even the way questions are asked and prompt can prompt a person to think along certain lines or of certain details. A very interesting line of psychological study. Hashlish tries to gauge Zorian's divination experience and is floored when Zorian already has North Finding under his belt on top of his suite of library search tools. This handily shortcuts the homework Hashlish had prepared and so he skips directly to object analysis. Hashless disgorges an array of random items from a sealed envelope to some kind of giant nut. <laughs> Hashless gets into the lesson, and Zorian is quite happy with the results. But while Zorian is kind of talk up Hashless, he forgets that he's dealing with an expert interrogator here, and the investigator cuts to the chase and asks what the heck Zorian wants. For a brief moment, uh, privacy wards go up, and Zorian drops the information about the invasion into Sayoria. War trolls smuggled in, the city bombardment, the whole commute. As he believes, Hashlish is actually kind of highly placed within the agency. Hashlish is tempted to bring Zorian in for interrogation, but waves off the concern, as Zorian can simply claim it was a prank. We get a nice little tidbit of how the Mage Guild has a separate system of law enforcement, as they don't trust civilians to judge them fairly. Hmm. Seems there is a slight adjustment to the typical feudal formula of the monarchy, the nobility, and the church. There's a fourth faction, the Mage's Guild. I uh, kind of wonder how that perhaps shakes up the usual power balance, because if you have three major factions, you have like a bit of a tripod, and then you can sort of have like a two versus one versus in certain um, alignment of interests. But with four factions, you can have a bit of a deadlock, a bit of a draw 2v2 situation, and that could be dangerous depending on how things work. Zorian leaves the tavern and heads back home to Amaya's place. 
to which he gets an earful as, though his paper plane successfully brought its message to her, it rammed right into the back of her head. That's so dangerous. What if it had hit her in the face and poked out an eye? Zorian, have much more consideration of your landlord. Some people can never be happy. You, the sitcom stinger, and the laugh track. We cut to a cozy domestic scene. Uh, Kiriel is doodling while Zorian is practicing his levitation on a snail, which is a step up from the inanimate pens due to living creatures having inherent magic resistance, but also due to it fighting against the effect by wiggling around. I think this is kind of a fun tidbit, how Zorian is actually specifically levitating the shell of the snail rather than the whole snail itself. And it's particularly interesting that spells can kind of be targeted with such granularity rather than like whole objects. And I kind of wonder how specific or broad that can be. Uh, can he try and levitate just the hand of someone, just their legs? There's a lot of tricky things you can do with sudden shifts in a person's posture or an impediment they were not expecting. I think this could be a hint at Zorian's possible development of a more finesse-based combat style, as he's already ruminated that he'll never match people when it comes to the raw magic power department. Turns out him and his sister are waiting for Kale, as he's giving a bit of a catch-up tutoring lesson to Kale, and Creel wants to sit in and learn as well. Zorian thinks about not taking Kiri to Sayoria too often, as it does take up a bunch of his home time he could rather spend studying, but as a once in a while thing to take it easy, kind of nice. We skim through Zorian giving touch points on the curriculum the first two years of the academy, memorization of chants and gestures, intros to magical traditions and disciplines, biology, history, geography, law, and mathematics. I think it's kind of interesting that they specifically are teaching law to kids, as well as introducing them to different cultures. Uh, I certainly think law and finance are woefully undertaught in uh, curriculum, despite their importance in day-to-day -day life. At least, the school I have gone through. Hyven interrupts everyone, bursting in with a breaking news headline. Apparently, Zack killed an infamous mage dragon named Oganji, who had occupied northern... Latzia for over a century. Looks like we now know what was killing Zack all these past loops. Zorian is baffled at what Zack did it for. Draconic magic is no use to him, and the time loops mean nothing with the Horde, so it's the value of it doesn't matter. Um, he starts speculating on how Zack could have gone from struggling to pass the mage exam to slaying a notorious dragon, and Zorian shamelessly toss out, tosses out Time travel? Good to know Zorian hasn't lost his sense of humor. Hey, sir. Oop. Still, Ivan lays out some bait for him, and Zorian considers telling them about the time loop. He already told Hashlush about the invasion, so what's the worst that could happen at this point? Ivan doesn't buy what he puts down, and leaves shortly after. Kale and Creel, however, actually believe him. He goes through explaining events, and Creel sums it up. So you are a time traveler, but you can only go one month into the past and only until one specific day, said Eriel carefully. And you don't control any of it, except by deliberately killing yourself. You are the lamest time traveler ever, Eriel opinionated. <laughs> Leave it to a younger sister to summarize complex events. We jump ahead a few days, and Zorian is actually a bit disappointed by their reactions. They ask him questions whenever they can, but they don't really change their reactions much. Giriel mostly critiques how he's still going to school throughout all of these loops. Kale takes Zorian aside and brings up that he's been researching the situation. Turns out Kale has managed to locate the likely spell that Lich used on Zorian oh so long ago, Soul Meld, commonly used to create familiar bonds and other soul bonds in general. After learning this, Zorian has a sudden realization and asks Kale if he's a necromancer. Kale helpfully clarifies that he does not enslave the dead or curse people, but there is more to soul magic than that. 
And it turns out Kale's old mentor knew a little bit of necromancy and wanted to pass the tradition on. Very interesting. Too bad Kale's mentor has already passed on. They try and do some diagnostics, but Kale is an amateur and whatever is going on with Zorian's soul situation is quite advanced. Never one to pass up another card to add to his deck. Zorian asks if Kale would teach him a bit of soul magic. Unfortunately, to really learn soul magic, you need the ability to perceive the soul to a certain degree, and that can only be gained by a special potion. It can basically only be made once every 23 years from a very specific species of moth when it pupates. Well, that or extremely illegal and morally heinous spells involving human sacrifice. Yet yeah, Zorian doesn't wish to use the latter option. He's lost in his thoughts over what he has learned and heads back to his room. When he enters, a familiar presence brushes against his mind and he panics. So you are open? A voice resounds in his mind, clear unlike the chaotic noise and images like last time. Interesting. You have met one of us before. This will be easier than I thought then. A spider, no bigger than his chest, leaps onto his bed. It looks kind of similar to a jumping spider. Greetings, Zorio Kaczynski. The spider spoke telepathically. I have been wanting to meet you for a while now. You and I need to have a long, long talk. Oh ho. It looks like those telepathic spiders have decided to meet him. We open the next chapter with Zorian in a bit of a situation. The spider seems to have paralyzed him, purely mentally, basically locking him out of controlling his own body. We get an amusing byplay of Zorian thinking about something and the spider responding to it as Zorian had said it. The spider amuses that Zorian is untrained and isn't surprised considering how humans treat mind magic. Zorian finds himself confused. The spider clarifies that Zorian has the gift, and that's in all capitals, and points out that Zorian can feel the emotions of others, a telltale sign of empathy. Zorian denies it, citing his antisocial tendencies. Of course he couldn't be an empath. The spider retorts with effectively a mental and verbal equivalent of a eye roll, saying how all Aranea are open, but some are still loners. The spider says it's a matriarch and has come to find why Zorian has issues with their web and sick enforcers on them. Zorian is initially confused before realizing the rumor mongering he started to keep Tyven alive seems to have a, seems to have had other ripple effects in the world. Zorian tries to think of a way to explain things to the spider without revealing too much, only for the spider to chime in. I suppose this is something related to this time loop you're trapped in. Then, the spider asks innocently. It is difficult to convey uh, exactly how smug the spider seems while controlling the conversation. It's very clearly someone with great amount of experience and thorough in its planning. It had actually been monitoring them for a while before it dropped in on Zorian, and it had easily lifted information from Kale and Kiriel, as they were not open. Again, this is capitalized, so it means something specific, though we don't know what yet. And they had virtually no defenses while also detecting no intrusion. Zorian is somewhat miffed that spilling the beans on time traveling has bit him in the butt in such a roundabout way. The spider is exasperated at Zorian's constant thoughts of the spider as a hostile threat. I know our kind looks threatening to your eyes, but please stop thinking of me as some suffering beast out to each you or some sadist intended to torture you into insanity for absolutely no reason. We're no worse than humans, really. Which, uh, Spider? Uh, how many humans have you met? There's some pretty terrible peoples. Zorium wonders why the Spider cares, since the Enforcers will get tired of searching and none in the web have been harmed. The spider clarifies that after spying on Zorian's little group, it has learned something vastly more concerning. It's being memory wiped at regular intervals. 
Zorian points out that he doesn't feel comfortable chatting with the spider, considering the current situation. You know, him paralyzed, unable to move in his bed, spider standing in his bed, looming over him, talking to him telepathically. Kind of got a bit of a night terrors, paralysis demon kind of thing going on. A little concerning. The spider bluntly points out that it doesn't trust him, and it hasn't lived this long by underestimating mages. Mm. Classic standoff. The spider, however, decides to leave him. Zorian is a bit confused, since there isn't any reason for him to track down the spider later. But the spider dangles some tantalizing bait in front of Zorian. She can tell that he's interested in what it means to be open. Secondly, the spider has some important clues for him to figure out what's going on and how to get out of the loop. And finally, working with the spiders isn't going to be the slog he assumes it is. I'm a leader of a shadowy group of mind-reading spiders that have their feelers throughout the entire city. Surely you can see how a group like that could be useful in making sense of this event? Point, match, set goes to the spider. Zorian understands the totality of what is on the table. The spider effectively saunters off by gently suffusing his mind until he goes a little eevee sleepy for a few minutes. The spider is gone when he regains consciousness. Zorian considers it, but decides he doesn't really have a choice. He would need to go to the spider, but he has no intention of rushing as soon as possible. He can make preparations. Now that he had a name, Aranea, his search on telepathic spiders can be much more focused. He ends up finding a number of books ascribing many different magical abilities to them. Either there's many subspecies of Aranea, the authors are making stuff up, or the Aranea were multidisciplined mages with a flexible magic system. It's gonna be the third one, ain't it? Yeah. The yeah, Azorian is not allowed to catch any breaks. Zorian also wanted to get some answers to the spider's claim that he was an empath. Zorian had noticed that his landlord had an interest in many esoteric magics from her bookshelves. He figures it was worth a shot to ask if she knew any ways of checking for empathy. Amaya wonders why he thinks it's unlikely after being told by another empath. He counters that it should be obvious to a person with empathy. Right? She points out that it's very easy to have false positives because empathic tells, like knowing a person's feeling and mood, could be inferred by other tells. She inquires if he's ever had an instinctive feel about a person he just met. Zorin basically always does, and it tends to be accurate. This is unusual? Oh boy. This is a fascinating topic of perception. The things we experience we often take as a given and assume are the same to others. It can be as simple as a culture shock of tea served in on ice instead of steeped in hot water. It could even be as big as things that are medically concerning, but you know, you've always lived with it and uh, you thought everyone else did too. Zorian tries to justify his sense that it's just some people have intense personalities. It's easy to read them, you know? Amaya doesn't buy it. She asks some further questions about groups of people. Zorian casually comments about, yeah, they have a, people give off like a big pressure. That's why he tries to avoid them. He think it's a headache if he's near a large group. Hey, his headache is even worse when it's a large, emotionally charged group of people. Amaya summarizes the situation. Your empathic abilities are so strong that you literally feel the emotions of the crowd as tangible mental pressure bearing down on you, said Amaya after watching him pace around for a while, and you think there is nothing to indicate that you are an empath. Zorian is exasperated. How was he supposed to know what the pressure was? It was always there. Seems like Zorian now has another skill to go down the road of learning. This loop is paying dividends, if the dividends are a multiplying hydra of side quests. We cut to an interminable time later with Zorian and Kale at the sewers, heading out to meet the spiders. Seems Kale took great umbrage at the unethical use of mind magic the matriarch used on him to glean information from his thoughts. 
Kale has used a mind shield spell, so the spiders likely couldn't connect to him like Zorian, who's staying open. When they finally meet the matriarch, Zorian asks if she could speak out loud instead of mind to mind, so as to include Kale. The spider seems to cast a spell, then explains that she is using something like a magic mouth spell, a sonic illusion. We have a brief back and forth between the matriarch and Kale, arguing about mind reading and customs. It seems non-psychics, called flicker minds by the matriarch, are considered fair game. And there's a bit of an undertone of derision in the term she uses uh, when she says that. Zorian gets everyone back to the subject at hand, the time loop. The matriarch wants in on the time loop, not physically, since Zorian does not yet have the ability to include people, but she can make a packet of memory and store it in Zorian's mind if he allows. This will effectively let her continue her thoughts across time loops. Kale kind of wants something similar. We get a name for the matriarch, a series of images and concepts. Zorian tries to interpret them and arrives at Spear of Resolve striking straight at the heart of the matter. Bit of a mouthful in pure text, but I absolutely adore more poetic names. And honestly, it makes a lot of sense for a group of sapients focused more on mind-to-mind -mind connection and sharing their language and entire concept of self-identity via a name is influenced by what they have available. You know, they're telepathic. They don't have written things written down. Um, so like the way they're going to express themselves is going to be through images and, and feelings that they can convey I wonder if the Aranea changed their names throughout life. If you're a child, you hardly have a lot of ideas and images to use to form a name from. Maybe their names change as they age, or it could even act as a title. Do they choose their own name, or are they given a name? I have so many, so many questions about spider culture, which unfortunately is not the spider at hand, but I really hope we learn so much more. Unhelpfully, it seems these hawks are going to have to be paused as a band of war trolls rudely interrupt. We open the next chapter with some great quipping between Zorian and the Matriarch about Aranea running speed being lacking, and it's kind of hard to find in his research. Her web being accosted by war trolls constantly despite anti-divination wards. Hmm, almost as if... The invasion forces have foreknowledge of where the Aranea are. Hmm. Hmm. After stalling the war trolls with the traps Zorian and co. had prepared in case the Aranea talks had gone south, they escaped the sewers. When no one else is around, the matriarch mentions offhand about Cephiliac rats, and we finally get a description of those weird rats Zorian encountered in his very first life of this month. The ones with the exposed cranium. Apparently, they are a kind of hive mind psychic and likely working with the invasion as spies. After some consideration of what the RNA are offering, Zorian concedes to the memory packet from the matriarch. We cut to Zorian and Kale returning home, and Zorian explains that he was able to find out about the limitations of mind magic. Serious brain rewrites are not something simple, easy, or really capable of being done on a whim in a stealthy manner. So the memory packet isn't as dangerous as it could have been. Zorian also brings up one of the explosive cubes he had made and was carrying, and how if things went seriously bad, he would have simply used a trickle of magic faster than he could have been incapacitated. Whew. Now that is certainly a drastic fallback technique. A time loop scenario certainly skews your priorities and also opens up a lot of options. Plus, the memory packet will last a year, minimum, and he planned on checking with some experts to examine his mind for influence. The date of the invasion fast approaches, and Zorian becomes certain that Hashlish isn't going to be doing much about it, despite him bringing things up. He resolves to take Creel out of Sioria before the invasion happens. We have some quiet scenes of living in Amaya's house, 
A bit of poking fun at Zorian's expense by his sister on the empath abilities being revealed and assuming he's also now a healer. Eventually, Creel asks why Zorian studies so hard, even though nothing matters and the loop resets. This leads us to some great tidbits on how Zorian thinks and is driven. First of all, everything matters. You are what you do, and if I were to start doing stupid things just because there is seemingly no consequence for them, those actions would eventually come to define me. Wondering what had brought on the question, he asks her about what she would rather be doing. She excitedly brings up her art, and asks if he would critique them. What proceeds is Zorian thinking he's about to give some helpful words to his younger sister, only to have a slow, dawning realization. His sister is actually really fucking good at art. And it turns out, this is why Kriel has always been looting Zorian's supplies. He had made some comments about it in earlier chapters, but never really dwelled on it or thought deeper. She was secretly practicing art because their mother wouldn't buy her supplies for it. Zorian's a little flippant towards Kriel's concern, telling her it'll be no big deal once she's out of the house and at the academy, only for his sister to explode on him. You're away from her most of the year and she can't do anything to you while you're away. I'll never get to do that. It's not the same because I'm a girl. It all comes home now. Why Kriel is so secretive, why she has been avoiding Mother learning anything about her plans when she was trying to convince Zorian to take her to Sayoria, or stealing his books to read them and try and teach herself some magic, trying to wheedle some tutoring from Zorian. His parents had no intention of sending her to Magic Academy. They have even graciously <laughs> arranged for a marriage once she turns 15. Zorian is, uh, incredibly displeased at this news. He backs up Kiri and promises he will help her stand up to their parents. He defied their parents by himself. That doesn't mean Kiri has to do the same thing. Because he will be there. And she will always have a teacher from him. A few days before the festival, Kale pitches his plan to Zorian. He gives a list of people who can teach Zorian things related to soul magic and or time travel. None of them are nearby, so Zorian would have to blow off school and actually do a bit of traveling. Ooh. See more of the land. Interesting, interesting. Some hints that maybe we're not going to be stuck in a school situation forever. They all board the train as the loop comes to an end. And Zorian wakes up once again at his home, in a new loop. He doesn't bring Kriel with him this time, which turns out to be a good idea, as Zack had shown up in class. It takes six restarts where Zorian has to lay low to, to Zack approaching him, only practicing shaping skills and other miscellaneous things that are unlikely to be noticed by Zack or make a huge splash. Finally, the seventh loop since bringing Kriel back to Sayoria, Zack leaves Zorian well enough alone. And it's time to get down to business. And that is where our chapter recap is going to come to an end today. Now, um, because of a lot of things in these chapters dealing with memories and mind magic um and we had at the start the sort of detective quizzing him on various things after cutting off his vision i think it'd be interesting to perhaps talk about um things about uh, uh, uh there, there's a there's a paper i was uh reviewing because I, I remembered some things from it and it's um if you want to read more it's called eyewitness testimony and memory biases and the authors are Kara Laney and Elizabeth Loftus. And there's some really interesting things, it, as I mentioned earlier, regarding memory and psychology. 
Um, and they identify a lot of interesting experiments and ways that sometimes our, mi our minds can trick us. Um, they bring up a, a simple experiment of uh, sort of how, like how leading questions sometimes can lead to false memories where they had like a red car pass a yield sign, but in the clips that the people were shown, it wasn't a yield sign, it was a stop sign. And then later they showed another bunch of clips to those people. Um, and some of the clips had the stop sign. Some of the clips had a yield sign this time. And then they were told to pick out which of the clips was like the original. And the people who had gotten the leading question more often were incorrect because they were kind of primed to assume it was actually a yield sign. There's also some interesting bits when it comes to the very movie stereotypical. They have the the perp lineup where they have a bunch of people line up and then they have someone uh, they have the eyewitness, you know, pick out who did whatever is being um, discussed. But there is still a lot of potential problems that can come about that from the details of the witness um, experiencing it. You know, they may not have perfect 2020 vision. You know, there may have been a lot of time between seeing whatever the event is and then being um, brought in to try and point out um, a person related to it. Um, the phrasing of the instructions could um, indicate things. You know, if uh, the people lined up have anything particularly noteworthy that could perhaps draw the eye or be particularly memorable can bias a person in thinking of them incorrectly as someone who was present or not. Um, and another uh, interesting bits is also identifying someone who isn't uh, a, a similar race to your own or um, a race that you didn't grow up around. And that is also reflected if you follow anything regarding facial recognition or things like that. Um, it's very common for US based facial recognition software to only really be effective against um, Caucasian peoples. And in a bit of a similar, you know, local bias, uh, Chinese facial, facial recognition software tends to be mostly only effective against um, those more Asian um, look presenting. And it's like these systems used to identify people, you know, there are these base inherent biases that it's very hard to actually control for. And the mind and memory are very complex things. There's also a very interesting thing they bring up um, about brain schemata, because basically, you know, our everyday lives, there's kind of a lot of patterns that we go through, a lot of familiar things, a lot of familiar spaces. And so what our brains will actually do to try and save time or, you know, save energy, you know, because thinking is an expensive process biologically, um, is it will kind of like save a template. So an example, like you could just remember a library, it has shelves, you know, there's tables, you got librarians. You don't really remember specifics of any particular library. You just know hey, that's a library. But whenever you're recalling a library, are you recalling that specific library? Or are you just recalling the schema, the general shape of a library that you have saved in your mind? Hmm? There can even be an entire subsection related to things like false memories, which I feel is is a whole whole topic in and of itself. Um, you know, descriptions of plausible events and then people form assumed memories, even though they never did actually experience that event. And I think a very poignant one line um, that I pulled out of that paper that I, I think is is very important to consider a memory is no less memorable just because it is wrong. I think, I think that's, I think that's a nice little one-liner because it is extremely true. And a lot about what we exist and perceive is often influenced by how we remember things and how we see things. And it's, 
it could be it could be a little it could be a little odd to go down and try and constantly examine things and think get too deep down the philosophical rabbit hole uh pondering those kinds of things um but with the story starting to introduce mind magic and you know memory reading and memory storage i feel like it's going to be a good thing to keep in mind for us the ways that minds can be tricked the way that the mind can be wrong and perhaps the ways we need to pay attention to what might be happening either described in the text what's not said by what's happening in the text and things that seem to be changing oddly from one description to the next in the text I think that's going to be it for Serial Bookworms today. Uh, the next meeting is going to be on the 13th of April. We'll go over chapters 19 through 21. <laughs>